Hello, the 50s and early 60s threw up a raft of working class heroes, artists, writers, actors and pop stars. At the pop epicentre of this swinging scene was an exotic young man from the East End, Lionel Bart. After writing hit rock and pop records, he went on to write and produce a string of very English musicals, most of which slayed the critics, packed in the audiences and brought him fabulous wealth, fame and trouble. The pressures of celebrity proved too much and Bart's career declined into a haze of drugs and alcohol for the next 20 years. By his own estimation, he got through 35 million pounds during that period. In tonight's film, Daniel Wiles looks at Lionel Bart's remarkable musical talent and his big comeback, his return to centre stage with the revival of his show, Oliver, at the London Palladium. I was sitting with my piano. <laughs> Just a minute. Could I have some more? More? Who is this lad? And all the children yell. Oliver, Oliver, never before had the boy wanted more. Oliver, Oliver, they won't ask for more when they know what's in store. There's a long, thin, winding staircase without any banister. We should throw him down and feed him on cockroaches served in a canister. <laughs> I'm reviewing the situation. I must quickly look up everyone I know. Title people, who oh, are the station? We can help me make a real impressive show. Look to Roman Iron, that is why she satisfied. Closer, closer. If I tell you, honey, this is how I think of heaven, do you mind? career was born in the Soho coffee bars of the 50s. Coffee is a stimulant. It stimulates the nerves, alerts the brain, wakes up the, um, yeah. Espresso, coffee, coffee, cappuccino. And we used to hang out around jukeboxes drinking endless cappuccino. In fact, it was this new craze for coffee that inspired Bart's first ever published song. I wrote a cockney song called O for a cup of tea instead of a cappuccino. And I went into this publisher, just along here, and he said, yeah, this will be great for a Billy Cock band show, and lo and behold, he phoned Billy Cock up. I was so impressed. And she phoned him up, he said, I've got this young songwriter in here with a song for you. Wakey, wake, hey! And that was the first thing I ever had on the radio. It was only a one-up thing. But I got the bug. The coffee bars were a place for young people to meet and play music. And in 1955, Lionel Bart met a young man whose fortunes he changed dramatically. I walked the pavements all along, missed the cracks in every stone, time to... You never forget meeting Lionel for the first time. There was this big, high, velvet fedora hat. 
protruding from it was a nose of enormous expanse that would have made Serrano feel ashamed. There was a red jerkin, a long coat that struck to the floor, so he looked a little bit like Dopey of the Seven Dwarfs. And he was singing, There Ain't Nothing Like a Dame. This was Lionel Bart. Borrowed a blue, my Tommy Steele was there on leave for the Merchant Navy, sitting in a corner, playing Bill Haley stuff, Chuck Berry stuff, Elvis Presley stuff, which... It, we hadn't had that much access to. We'd heard bits about it. Oh, Compton Street, where's that? So oh. Tommy Steele, you're not playing your guitar in a cafe in So oh if I know anything about it. But he, because he was in the Merchant Navy, he was back and forth every two weeks. And uh, we decided to form a band. So we called ourselves the Cavemen. Lionel Bart. Yes, it is. One of the members of the original group, Lionel Bart. Come in. <laughs> Now, Lionel, you tell me, what was the story of the caveman, will you? Well, it all began in this uh, basement, the cave. <laughs> That's where we first met, where I first met Tommy. Yeah. And uh, we all got together, and uh, together with another chap called Mike Pratt, we formed this group called the Cavemen. And we had this song, What Were the Caveman? And a record contract. That was a ticket to ride. Before we knew it, I was being asked to write a film of his life story. All over wherever we may roam to, or any shore where we may be blown to, we'll know that we're gonna feel at home to Opera. Musical. From that moment on, really, I became Tommy Stewart's backroom boy, writing all his songs and all the films. Boulders, brass, right then and then the little white boy quickly found the nearest road to town and people said what a funny little boy, what a fluffy little boy is our little boy. He marched along a proud boy and hit the town. In 1958, Bart's songwriting talent launched another pop legend. In spite of his success in the field of pop music, Bart's real passion was for the theatre. In 1952, he joined the Left Wing Unity Theatre as a scene painter, but before long found himself writing songs for the productions. The last thing I did at the Unity Theatre was called Wally Pound, King of Soho, and it was based on Ben Johnson's Volpone, and it contained that song, Good Night, Dearie. Good night, Dearie. Good night, honey. Do you need any company? Although Bard wrote this song for the Unity Theatre, in fact, he used it in his first collaboration with Joan Littlewood at Stratford East. things than what they used to be. 
um, changed the face of musicals. Uh, we all became fashionable to talk like me. It was lovely up until then. It all been, you know, hello, I'm frightfully like this. And I mean, I would never have stood a chance of, of, of starring in anything. It, I was always the maid who opened the door and said, oh, oh yes, tea, tea's ready, my lady, and <laughs> things like that. There's top with toffee noses and pups in coffee houses and things like what they used to be. If, if you're doing a very serious play and it calls, as it sometimes does, for swearing or for certain shock words, it's all right, but not to get laughs. That I object Well, I to. must tell you now that originally it wasn't designed to get laughs. Do you want the story? Yes. The story is very simple. Joan Littlewood met me and she said, here we have an idea for a play which Frank Norman had written. It was about a 25-page document and the grammar wasn't there. You had to read it a few times for it to sink in. But when you had read it, you felt that here was true Cockney dialogue. Language as one knew it, if one had been in Soho for any length of time. Soho? Yes, the real I've Soho language. I shopped in Soho. I've never heard anything like that. Well, darling, you don't shop at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> People got off on was the truth of it. It went right across the board. I, mean, I brought Judy Garland to see it five or six times, and she just loved it. Uh, I've written a song for you, and I sang this song, and it stopped the show, believe it or not. It went to the West End. We ran for two and a half years. The, the song stopped the show in um, in the West End, and and a big hit. And everything seemed to change. You know, as I say, it became very fashionable to kind of look like me and and talk like me. It was okay to think and thought and thirty three, and I owe that down to Lionel. Lock up your daughters where fancy cannot roam. In 1959, Bart followed things with another hit, Lock Up Your Daughters, based on Henry Fielding's comedy, Rape Upon Rape. So you'd better lock up your daughters now. The first thing you, you have to say about Lionel Bart's shows is that they are genuinely British musicals. I mean, for all they tell us about contemporary Britain, uh, the, the Andrew Lloyd Webber shows or Les Miserables might as well be set in outer space. You know, they're, they're about cats, they're about roller skates, they're about everything except Britain. Uh, Lionel Bart is, is really one of only a handful of people in our culture who've managed uh, to put British characters, recognizable British characters, on the contemporary musical stage and, and make them hip and make them fashionable. Bart's next project was as British as you could get, and the young Barry Humphreys auditioned for a part. I was somewhat in awe of Lionel Bart, of course, because he was already a celebrity. He had two shows running in the West End, an unheard of phenomenon. First time since Noel Card, or perhaps Ivan Novello. Uh, he had Lock Up Your Daughters at the Mermaid Theatre and at the Garrick Theatre. Things ain't what they used to be. These were hit shows in London, and now he'd been bold. In fact, more indeed Philistine enough to propose a musical version of Oliver Twist. I kind of felt a great affinity with that story. And somehow I'd always known the story. Bart's East End upbringing and coming from a big Jewish family gave him an instinctive feeling for Dickensian London. Please, sir. Mm -hmm. I want some more. Uh -huh. mm, boy! I know the image of the kid asking for more with the bowl was always with me. Privately, one heard 
that the producer of the show, Mr. Donald Albury, didn't hold out very great hopes for it. In fact, had whispered to people that it wouldn't run very long, and if he were them, they should perhaps start looking for other work. Lionel, however, came to a lot of the rehearsals. He kept changing things, improving um, the material, tailoring it to suit the artists involved. And of course, there were kids swarming everywhere, and Lionel got on terribly well with them. He was a bit of a Pied Piper. Old Ripper, Old Ripper. That was the night with a large appetite. The show opened in 1960 and was an unprecedented critical and popular success, running for over two and a half thousand performances, at that time a West End record. the very first matinee and I sat there and I've I just loved that musical I, I consider it one of the greatest musicals of all time it completely took London by storm I mean it got exceptional reviews quite rightly and um, more than more than that um, its sheer originality as well as its geniality was totally embraced by the public and I, I remember booking my four and sixpenny um, gallery seat and queuing up within the first three months and just being blown away. I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, such energy and, uh, and drama in a musical. It, it was very, very unusual. And yet it was also very exhilarating. No, your eyes go pop. Anything. When you come down plop. Hey, everything will The opening night of Oliver was something quite sensational. And I was shoved onto the stage and the house lights were on and the whole audience was standing. And this was kind of spontaneous thing before it became ritual for audiences to stand and slow a hand clap. And they'd taken about 35 curtain calls. And we continued singing the songs and the audience came onto the stage and wouldn't leave. It was a most marvellous night. The thing I like about Lionel Bart's songs for Oliver is that there's a good eight or nine or ten songs in that that absolutely land, land those lyrics. They hammer them home to you so that kids, people love to sing them. It's not just that Oliver's a great show to watch, it's a great show to do. In 1968, Oliver became one of the most successful musical films of all time, collecting five Oscars. The first time I wrote for it was I wrote it in the car. It's the kids' anthem, it's a made up lullaby, really, that he made himself. It's called Where Is Love? And it's, musically, it's the root theme for the, for the rest of the songs, which are not indigenous things. The, the songs which are character songs come off of that tune. I 
it wasn't really so much for the kid Oliver in that situation, but it was about Charles Dickens, because I'd read some books about his own life and his own. It seemed to be very a plaintive thing about his own life, really. Where is love? You know, which, which most Broadway writers cringe at because the idea of dragging where over five music, making where a five-syllable word. You know, Oscar Hammerstein got grief for um, uh, when I'm calling you, ooh, 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 ooh. That's seven syllables. Lionel Bart is Britain's <laughs> biggest melisma king. <laughs> by dragging it out to five, so, you know. Everyone says, why didn't he write someone, to, someone tells me where is love? And, uh, you know, of course, you point that out to Lionel, and he says, uh, oh, well, you should see what these opera guys do. You know, well, that's not, that's the thing. He had all, the, he had so much interest in everything. He had interest in opera, in pop music, in art. And he just sort of dragged, he dragged it all, he piled it all in on top of him. And once, once, he struck gold with a perfect musical adaptation. So what am I to do to keep the sky so blue? There must be someone who will buy. The good thing about the Oliver songs is they're all different in, 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 in as much as what the subjects that they're singing about. I really enjoyed Who Will Buy because of the way it built up and the way we filmed it. Uh, we filmed it in sequence, so you had the rose seller come in, and every, and then the organ grinder, and then more and more people came in, and it was just so incredible to watch that. That was always a favourite of mine. Boy, when I thought, well, let's hope and pray to God that it's not going to be early MGM orchestrations. And uh, but it wasn't totally. There were one or two places in the film where, 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 where I could have lived with something more important. Something like uh, Who Will Buy, mm. which spread into something that could have been out of the Easter Parade with Judy Garland. <laughs> it was just not right. <laughs> Lionel isn't really a composer in that sense. He, he writes, if you, if you think about it, he, he tends to write the way music, the way his characters would walk. When I see someone rich, both my thumbs start to itch, only to find some peace of mind, I have to pick a pocket or two, you got to pick a pocket or two. If you look at when uh, Lionel Bart writes with other composers, he just writes the lyrics, then it doesn't, you know, you look at Lock Up Your Daughters, where Laurie Johnson, the guy who did the Avengers theme tune, he did the music for that. And Lionel Bart's words are okay, but they're, but they're words on notes. Now, if you compare that with consider yourself well in, you know, that well in is brilliant. Big, fat words that land on the notes. And the reason why, it's because He's not a composer, and he conceives it as a whole. Words and music, words to be sung, and words uh, that are in the rhythm of those characters. Consider yourself at home. Consider yourself one of the family. We've taken to you so strong. It's clear we're going to get to long. Because of the, 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 the incredible complexity of the dancing and the timing, and we had to do the scenes over and over again. I mean, the, the, the timing was split second. Turn out to be an 
incredibly successful film. Uh, I didn't personally uh, know that much about it, but my father used to come in every week with a variety, the American uh, magazine, and he would show me that Oliver was still at number one. And this went on for over a year, and it was consistently in the top 10 for something like 65 weeks, which is pretty good going. Writers don't last, shows last, and in that sense, you know, Oliver is a very rare thing. It's the one British musical that's revived every five years. It's playing somewhere all over the world. It's indestructible. It's perfect. Boom! That's it! Hold it! <laughs> that's it! That's it! That's it! That's the trouble. Oh, it's terrible. Think E flat there, you see? E flat! Think e flat! E flat! E flat. And usually for a composer, Bart can neither read nor write music. You know, for instance, we have a new opening for the show, which Lionel has composed. It's, you know, he comes and sings in this funny way because he can't write music or anything like that. But, you know, it goes on. If you're the guy who can create the tunes, you're the composer. If you can write words, sung words to characters, the fact that you don't know how to put those little notes down on paper is nothing to do with it. You can pay a guy $20 to do that. Yeah. I like that. Can we mark it? Sure. Yeah. Because it's got a kind of feeling of traveling. You know, Victor Herbert told Irving Berlin that he should uh, take some uh, lessons in uh, composition and orchestration. Berlin stuck it for a couple of days uh, before he figured out that, you know, that son of a bitch, I could be writing songs while I'm doing this. And that's, and that's what Lionel Bart does, a songwriter, not a composer. <laughs> When I broke that show of lifts, it wasn't really my title, it was Herman Goering's, wasn't it? <laughs> but it was basically about my childhood, and I tried to say it in that show, you know? Lionel Bart was born Lionel Begleiter in 1930. His parents, like many European Jews, had settled in the East End after the First World War. Right, this is Uga Street. They're calling it Lukin Street now. Doesn't look like any kind of street. Oh God, there's odd people walking up and down. <laughs> but it's just corrugated iron. It's grass behind everything. Grass in there, where it was once cobblestones. Kids playing on the streets. I never saw grass, never, never saw my first cow till I got evacuated. I'm leaning against 27 Princess Street, Drip Lane, and this is the Ellen's the Opticians. Um, I used to live above here. It looks big, but nine of us, and a mum and dad, and a few animals, one room in each floor. It used to make a lot of noise, and the old optician would bang 
with his broomstick up on the ceiling. Catch the pack in the noise. Then we'd escape on top of the roof. We used to get a bit of sun. It was dirty out there. Working hard enough. If my father was running this shop, nobody would be talking. <laughs> he was a slave driver, my dad, right? Oh man. He only had seven guys working for him. But um, most of them were my brothers and a couple of sisters and me. He was all right, my old man. Mind you, they used to have these terrible vows because my mother always thought he was after other ladies, which of course he was. When I was about 14 or 15, I, I remember sneaking off, I think, from school and borrowing my, um, my father's dinner jacket to go to the world premiere performance of Blitz in the Regal Edmonton. Um, it was, I've never seen anything to this day as, as, as extraordinary as that, that production. So one was totally aware that Lionel Bart was absolutely the giant of the musical theatre at that time. I mean, he was as well known then as Andrew Lloyd Webber is now. Oh, Maggie, Maggie May, pack your bag and talk In 1964, away. Bart was drawn to Liverpool, which was fast becoming the place to be. Maggie May was another urban musical, this time set in the Liverpool docks. I've met John Lennon by this time, early John Lennon. And Brian Epstein had discovered me at the Sea Beatles manager. And uh, I've been down to Liverpool seeing early Beatles and early Silla Black in the cavern and I, I thought they had something going there. You're a great big mech, aren't you? Paddy from head to toe. You could have built the Mersey Tunnel on your own with them hands. His use of, um, of blending recitative and dialogue and song together is something which you know, was a way ahead of his time. I mean, I think he, he ranks alongside Frank Lesser as someone who is a naturally gifted writer of musicals. Go and see Blitz and Maggie May, and you see what an extraordinary gift he had. My sweet pet lamb, Bart, in 1965, was about as successful as any British songwriter could ever dream of being. He was a theatrical legend in the sense that it was widely assumed he couldn't put a foot wrong. Uh, things I want, they used to be Oliver, uh, Lock Up Your Daughters, Maggie May, these were all hits. By now, Bart was living the jet set life. With houses in London, New York and Malibu, and a castle in Tangiers, he was enjoying all the temptations that 60s celebrity had to offer. The Moody Blues were also flying high at the time, and Justin Hayward remembers Bart's endless hospitality. Lionel's house was always open house. There was always a little bit of a party going on in one corner of it, whatever time of the day or night that you wanted to go by. The, the official parties must have cost maybe three or four grand at the time. Looking So now it would what, be 30 or 40 thousand pounds each time for a party. There's just so much money coming in from everywhere, you know. I spend some, of course, but, you know, with a little help from my friends. It's very easy to spend money. It's very easy to make money. Uh, there were plenty of people around town who would exhibit presents that Lionel had given them, and one thought the money wouldn't 
could never last too long. I was working hard, living hard, playing hard. I would party for three days, work for three days and nights, sleep for three days. <laughs> When fame and enormous amounts of money are showered on an individual, particularly a sensitive and gifted individual like Lionel Barnes, you know, it's nothing you can be trained to cope with. You don't go to a special university and get a degree in managing success. Also, I think Lionel, more than most people, was surrounded by swarms of parasites. Rich and famous didn't actually go together. There were much smarter people who uh, specialised in taking the money off you, you know, that had been doing it for such a long time. They were much better at keeping it than you were. His fame was so great, and his, therefore his power was so great, that the method of theatre that he had, which was really working with a bunch of mates and throwing it together, and it worked, out, out, he, he outgrew that, and he didn't have people that, that could actually keep him at it. He, he, needed, he needed a really strong producer as well as working with a really strong director. And he ended up doing it all, basically producing the shows and directing them. And therefore nobody could focus him. He had his own publishing company, he had homes all over the world, he was fabulously wealthy. And suddenly, suddenly, it all fell apart. He did what everyone says you should never do. He invested in his own musical. I remember getting this phone call and I'm going to do twang this new musical. Masses of money being spent on it. No expense spared. Twang had all the makings of a huge success with a big budget, a Lionel Bart score and Joan Littlewood directing. And Lionel Bart was doing a show I should have known. We could have made it happen, you know. And we had a huge amount of money. It just got out of hand. The auditions in the early rehearsals took place in like, the gardens of my own home. It was like one of those terrible movies, let's do the show right here, you know? No one was finding twang, precisely as Lionel Bart had hopefully described it. A spoof and a little bit of fun. The £130,000 invested making twang the most expensive British musical yet was no spoof. The backstage morale hadn't exactly been improved by the news that Lionel Bart had asked for his name to be taken off the top billing unless he got complete control of the show. Nor was confidence in Twang's future helped by Joan Littlewood walking out the day after its Manchester opening, or by Bernard Delphont, one of the backers, backing out. Mr Delphont never really had any real faith in the show in any case. He Why do you think that was? He wasn't the main producer. Why? Yeah. Well, I think mainly because he wasn't the main investor. If you want the truth. Every one of my seeds have been changed at this time, you know. How do you cope with this kind of change? I mean, how do you make sure you don't put the wrong lines in the wrong place? Well, fortunately, at the moment, they're cut, actually, in just odd lines. But in Manchester, you know, they were putting in five scenes at a time. And that caused a lot of problems, because you can learn two or three, but not five. I mean, that's ridiculous. So what we used to do was write it on our hands, and also on the scenery. Oliver Messel's going to have a fit when he sees his scenery, because we've got all, all dialogue written, you know. And then I think that there was a slight difference of opinion between Mr. Bart and Miss Littlewood. Uh, one went in one direction, the other went in the other. So consequently, uh, the, 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 the script that we had didn't relate to the, to the songs and the numbers. There were two different methods of approach. Joan Littlewood was doing a commedia dell'arte, grow while you work thing on the scene, and I was doing songs elsewhere, and her scenes changed every day, and I just had to keep up with her. Consequently, when we opened in Manchester, the audience and I saw a number of the scenes for the first time. The musical director collapsed on the on the on at the dress rehearsal. Um, Lionel had been barred from the theatre. At this point, he and Joan weren't talking. Oh, it, it was frightening. 
No, I like Lana, but we're all half mad. One side of us is half mad. I don't pretend to be any charmer myself. But I do know a good show when I've got it. I, I remember one particular day, Joan had a terrible row with him and he, he stormed out and she said, well, it's him and it, it's typical, it's all that LSD. And I said, oh, Joan, don't say that. I mean, then, you know, we're all in this for, for the money. Thinking she meant pounds, shillings and pence, she said, oh, you are a dozy cow, Barbara. I mean, LSD. And then I had a little look at the lyrics. I thought, oh, yes, I see what she means now. <laughs> oh, dear. But he was so, he said, I'll take Nova. I said, well, good, thank God, take it. And then came the end of the, the, the end of the show. I mean, Lionel, because he'd had all these successful musicals, insisted that we did um, snatches from the show, you know, all the best songs, all the hits. Well, by, by now, the audience absolutely hated it, and they were almost snarling at us. I remember Jimmy Boo, who was playing Robin Hood, said, I'm not going out there, they hate us. I said, it's not our fault. It's not our fault. It's all their fault. The, the producer, the director, the songwriter, the, the, we're getting out there, duckies. And do you know, by the end of, of the song, the first song we were singing, um, dilly um bum dilly um whether you are two years old or 92 years old, dilly um bum by the time we did our about 50th dilly um bum the whole theatre was empty. They got up and walked out en masse. Nobody really booed us. It was anger, you could feel it. It was awful. I don't think any mum will suffer from what happens at the show. I think we've had enough suffering to date. So what was the reason that it didn't work then? I mean, you've described how it was set up and the contradiction between what you wanted and what Joan Littlewood wanted. And so what, why did it not... I think we had too much money, too much resources, too much spangle, too much razzmatazz, too much media hype up front, frankly, for what the thing was. It's a case in question where sometimes, often, limitations can be a great asset. Yeah. as was proven with when we did things in what it used to be yeah. with Jones ensemble way back in the 50s uh, did it set you back when it didn't work i mean it was probably the first time you hadn't in your life that something you touched hadn't immediately gone gold one way or another did you feel personally cast down by it you must have done. it wasn't just because of twang and it wasn't just because of a few other mishaps in my life with the near ones and that died I could use that as an excuse. Now, I really got fed up with the whole race and the, the pretentiousness of it all, the whole rat race. And I decided to be a bum, really. <laughs> and you see, this is where it is, really. I was looking for myself. You know, I wish it didn't take, didn't take so long to find out who the bloody hell you are in this life. <laughs> but sometimes it does, and it took me a long time. And I had to put myself through a lot of nonsense, you see. There's a lot of people experimenting with drugs at the time. You have spoken about that as well, haven't you? I mean, this was part of that period, wasn't it? We're looking, finding out about yourself and all that. It got to the point where I got very heavily into drinking and, every, and other things. I thought that uh, I was some kind of pioneer. In fact, no coward always used to try and give me that label. He said, we're both PB, Lionel. You're Pioneer Bart, and I'm pretty and beautiful. <laughs> I said, sure you are. I said, but, uh, he said, oh, uh, and, you know, he, when I sent him my score, my script of Hunchback to Noel, he sent it back to me. He said, obviously, you've been under the influence of drugs. Really? And it's true, I was experimenting with LSD at that time. Let's face it, you got more muscle you really. In the, I mean, my friends were trying to help me, bless them all, and I still have a large number of them. And uh, I wasn't listening to anybody. I was hell-bent. Because, as you said, it took quite a bit of time for you to get out of it. But it took, uh, presumably, it took quite a bit of time to get really into it as well. Well, who's counting? I've never really counted. <laughs> I like to be given the right to fail. And the fame game and the power game and the money game are so wrapped up together in this economy we live in that if you're not careful, they can eat you up. It's true to say that 
By 1917, uh, many people thought Lionel Bart might even be dead. It was said that when very strapped for cash, Lionel had sold his entitlements. I think it was known to people in the business that royalties no longer went in the direction of the author. Don't you drag me down memory lane. I'm not going down that place again. I know we had a good time there, but spare me all that pain. But I'm not tracing down memory lane again. Don't you drag me down memory lane. I don't like to think uh, about my mistakes too much, about the past. Unless uh, it's going to help me in the future. The only mistake I can think that I made is that I may have trusted too many of the wrong people. But then you either trust nobody or you trust everybody. Of all the people I know in this business that have had um, ups and downs, he is the least bitter man I've ever come across. I mean, considering that, you know, everyone else has made millions out of his creations. He is, you know, he regrets it. But he's never been sour. He's never been vindictive. I filed my bankruptcy petition about a year ago. And I, I'm not bitter about anything. I say that's a very negative uh, emotion bitterness. You don't get anything out of it, really. Something for the boy. Something for the baby. Have the dip in when we did the uh, Abbey commercial, it seemed like a nice small thing for him to get started on, to get some confidence back. Because frankly, there'd been, I don't know, 20 years where he'd really not tried his metal, and, and naturally he had doubts about himself. Yes, it's really you. Yes, it's really me. It had a huge impact with the public immediately that it went out. Memorable, simple, and childlike. And they gave a Novello Award, and almost certainly for the first time, for a piece of music on a commercial. So I was absolutely delighted. If you think of the origin of, of, of Lionel and his songs, like the Russian and the Jewish thing, there's a very strong um, singing tradition where small tales are told in a in a repetitive cycle and i know that lionel's always tried to get that thing that as soon as he's written something his ambition is to have the bloke the milkman whistle it in the street and you must admit, this is it, the starting of another happy ending. and he has survived both you know, tremendous financial um, problems and also health problems. I mean, you know, three years ago, I went to see him in the hospital and I really did wonder if I would see him again, as we all did. But, you know, he's a tough old bugger and he survived it and he's looked after himself um, and he's much more savvy now than he was 10 or 15 years ago. Just look at what Oliver earns now. If he'd, if he'd had that money, he would have been in a position to do anything he wanted. Um, he's, he has all this stuff in his trunk, uh, the Fellini thing, La Strada, uh, Quasimodo, the musical. I think I've still got a few new shows in me, really, a few things to say, do. And um, I can't spend too long down the memory lane, really. I hope he finds the collaborators that he needs in order to finish the work, because I think he won't do it on his own. He needs, he needs to work with someone. What happens when I'm 70? Must come a time, 70. When you're old and it's cold and who cares if you live or you die. Your one consolation that money Thank you.
Good evening, and welcome to the Delaware Lottery's All Cash Lotto Game. Profits from All Cash Lotto and all other lottery games help fund many state services making everyone who lives in or visits Delaware a winner. Now, join us at Lottery Headquarters in our state's capital, where tonight's winning numbers are about to be revealed. Match all six numbers with one of your plays and win tonight's $196,000 jackpot. Here are tonight's winning numbers. 11, 8, 23, 10, 22, 3. Here are the results from all of today's Delaware Lottery games. Don't forget to buy your tickets for tomorrow night's Powerball game. The jackpot has an estimated annuity value of $21 million. Good night and good luck. Great first day. Thanks. I had as much fun as the customer. This is so cool. I've never seen some of this stuff before. The more you're here, the more amazing things you'll see. Store of Knowledge. TV 12 celebrates and wishes you and your family a happy Passover. Today's programming on WHYY is made possible in part by Core States Bank. For over 14 years, Core States has helped to enrich our community through their generous support of public broadcasting in the Delaware Valley. Core States Bank. You know us, we know you. The philosophy of Jesus Christ is found throughout the New Testament. Author Stephen Mitchell compiled these teachings in his book, The Gospel According to Jesus. What you're about to see are people from all walks of life reading from this book. Women and men, young and old, rich and poor, educated and uneducated, black, white, yellow and brown, believers and unbelievers alike. People across America tell the story of Jesus. This is the book of the good news that Jesus of Nazareth proclaimed. John the Baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of renewal for the forgiveness of sins. And John was clothed in camel's hair with a belt of animal hide around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And people from all of Judea went out to him, many people from Jerusalem, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. And at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. And afterward, the Spirit drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days with the wild animals.
When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he settled in Capernaum by the lake, and began to teach and proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. As he was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a fishing net into the lake, and Jesus said to them, Come and follow me. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And walking on a little farther, he saw James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, who were their boat mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. And they came to Capernaum. And on the Sabbath, Jesus went into the synagogue and taught. And the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught like someone who had authority and not like the scribes. <laughs> Be'ara kedi bishemayam Havlan lachmana yomana de simkunam And when they left the synagogue, they went to the house of Shimon and Adam together with Yaakov and Yohanan. And Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. And as soon as they told Jesus about her, he went and took her by the hand and lifted her up. And the fever left her, and she served him. And that evening they brought to him everyone who was sick or insane, and the whole village was gathered at the door, and he healed many people. <clears throat> and early in the morning, while it was still dark, he got up, and went out to a remote place and prayed there. And Simon and his companions searched for him. And when they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next villages, so that I can proclaim the good news there too. And he went through all of Galilee, proclaiming the good news in their synagogue and healing many diseases. <laughs> came and knelt before him and said, If you wish, you can cleanse me. And Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said, I do wish it. Be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, Go and show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded. And the man went out and began to talk about it excitedly. And the news spread until Jesus could no longer go into a village but had to stay out in the countryside. And people came to him from every direction. And he went again to the lakeside and began to teach. And so many people gathered that he had to get into a boat on the lake. And he sat in it, and the whole crowd...